What's up, everyone? We are here with episode number 13 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast. We have a special guest, uh, Mr. Kerry Colette. How you doing down there in uh, Campbell, North Carolina? I'm doing good, Ben. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. But uh, Campbell's doing well. It's, it's a little chilly here for us in North Carolina. Typically, it's warmer, but uh, we had a cold day today, but it's good. What, what is the temperature? That, what's cold for you? Uh, I think today, I think when we woke up today, I think we might have been at 60, 65. Oh. Is, is typically cold here. Dog, it was 12 degrees when I woke up this morning. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, and I just, I saw, I know when I visited you uh, a little over a year back, you guys were um, thinking about getting a new wrestling room or had the plans, but you hadn't done it. And I guess I think I've seen since then that you have, uh, it, it's in service, right? You're using it? Yeah. It's the only reason I haven't, we've, we've taken, we put a lot of pictures online. We haven't done the video and really did the walkthrough because we still, we were, uh, I'm about another three weeks away from having all the new furniture in. We're about a week away from having all the wall pads up and probably about another three weeks in the graphics. So uh, people want to see it, but it, it's fully functional. If you walked in, you wouldn't know it wasn't finished. Yeah. I know it still has to be in here, so I'm just holding off until it's completely done. Perfect. That makes sense, makes sense to me. Um, yeah, so and the other thing that we need, I've announced it on the podcast, but you have a new segment, which I, I think is really cool. Um I think you're – a lot of times I was actually complaining about college coaches because they use coach speak too much. You have, but you are really like just genuine when you speak, and you have a segment called Questions with Colat. So I guess you've only done one, or has your second one came out yet? I think the second one actually comes out today. Today, yeah. Uh, I think Rudis will, will have it do their editing and put it out for me. So tell uh, us about that. So I, I started uh, Colat.com back in 2007. Um, and then through that, my partner, John Jira, he, he started a little YouTube channel and he was just using it to promote the website. Uh, and, and then it just grew. And, and, and so on the YouTube side, it, it went to like 125,000 subscribers and, wow. and we could just get a, a ton of questions on that side. And, and he was always bugging me to start doing a, a piece and answer some of these questions. And, and, um, so what I've been doing is, is once a week, just kind of going through the questions that these guys put out and they, I get them from all over the world. I mean, yeah. with subscribers and, and um, just genuinely trying to help some people, dads, coaches, kids, um, anybody I can help, just some of the questions, you know, diet, conditioning, yeah. how did I train, speed, all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that, that's really cool. So I do something fairly similar called Mental Mondays, which it was thought up by my wife and she said, she suggested we do a marital video like Facebook <laughs> Live. And I said, I, I'm not an expert. I've only, we've only been married for six years. Keep yeah. giving anyone advice, but I could give people advice about wrestling. So, um, yeah, that that that's a lot of fun. So I, you know, I'm looking forward. I watched your first one. Looking forward to uh, the rest of. Them. I didn't know your YouTube channel is that big. That that's pretty enormous, actually. I didn't even know. I didn't know for the longest time. I just, I, you know, he was handling it, and and um, and then one day we started looking at it and realized how it, it had grown. But it really did because it was effective. Like I've been talking to Matt a lot, but it's like. The mental Mondays you do are good because they're, they're, they're quick, they're to the point, and everybody's attention span is really like a five-minute attention span. And so the videos are short, minute and a half, and people come, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I admit minute and a half is perfect. So, okay, yeah. you kind of said something, um, and you and I, I got, I've only got to talk to you once in my life, and I think you're a fascinating person. So I, I was really excited to be able to do this. So I get, like, my very own questions with Colat. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I feel honored. Um so you talked about, you know, when you said you give people advice, dads, whatever. Um, obviously, in, in the Flow documentary, quite a bit was made with the relationship with you and your dad. Um, yeah. And I guess I don't even remember what you told me. Do you have kids? Are they wrestling? Um, and then, you know, obviously your dad's methods were fairly extreme. Would you, uh, you know, is there something you changed? Is there something you think would be perfect? I mean, have you put much thought into that at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always tell people this all the time, and they like to use my background, right? They say, well, you started at five. I started at five, and I had success pretty much all levels. Um, but there's always people that go against the rule. And if you start your son at five years, years old, chances are he'll probably quit before he gets to college or he's going to quit in college. It's just there's a, there's a cycle to this, and, and so there are people who go against the rule. I truly went against the rule. Um, but what I always tell people is this: they think my dad was this overshadowing figure through my wrestling career. And the truth is, by eighth grade year, I told my, my father, back off, leave me alone, stay away, <laughs> you know, uh, because you and um, and in the documentary, you know, when, when Flo shot that, they really did leave out segments. Right. So they, oh, yeah. they yeah, the shocking part. But my, my father was 
was um, in the wrestling side when I was young, was very involved. But outside of that, he was never an overbearing father. I had no curfew. I had the rules of engagement with him were if, you're, if your grades are good, you're not getting in trouble. And you, you socially, you're, you're being a good person. Then, I, I, you know, it's hands off. And and um, his I think his stress was manifested in him wanting to see his son achieve these goals that he laid out. That he was more stressed than I was. And, <laughs> yep. and that's I why it. I say the. Yeah, probably his problem was he made me too strong because by eighth grade, I was like, hey, back off where I run into kids now. And, and mom and dad are the kids, a, a senior in college, and, and they're still controlling his life. And I'm, I'm like, you need to get control of your own life. Yes, absolutely. And I, so I had a similar experience. My dad was, um, it kind of sounds a lot similar to yours, except in fifth or sixth grade, someone told him he was being an a-hole. Yeah, and, uh, to leave me alone, and he, and he left me, you know, from then on, it was just me, and, uh, yep. you know, they were very supportive, obviously, but uh, kind of same thing at home, as long as, uh, no curfew, as long as I was being good, had good grades, everything else, I was, you know, all set to go, so, okay, um, so then, so then in high school, you're pretty much driving yourself, and one of the things, and, you know, it, wrestling from your era, there isn't a lot of it on film, there's some no. of it, and so I actually, like, you know, it's funny when Matt and I pop on, on on this podcast that if I, if there's like one match I can't find from the weekend, it's like, what the hell? Why is that match not online? You know, we kind of yeah. like take it for granted. But so one of the things when I watch you is you obviously have great basics, right? But there's this uniqueness to your style. There's this uniqueness to the way you move. Um, I don't even, I don't want to call it like unorthodox or scrambling. It's just a little bit different, you know, a little twist to everything. Um, I guess where where'd your wrestling style come from? Developed yourself, high school coach, influential club coach. Um, where was that? So, at? so you know the term people always use, and I, and I don't like this term. I don't like the the God given talent term. I, I hate the, it. It doesn't yeah, exist. I, it suggests that that people are only getting things because that something was given to them. And, and but if if we all have something, right? Like so, if I say I, I think everybody has something, I always said my God-given talent was this: is that uh, I could see technique and I could go do it without drilling it. And for me, that started at like seven, eight years old. Yeah. And so, where wrestling for me got exciting, and I think you were the same way, is like, look, I wanted to be the guy that when people left the gym, they're like, wow, did you see that move that he hit? And, yeah. and people always use my backflip in, in the high school state finals. Yeah. To, you know, there was no need to do a backflip out of a single <laughs> head, you know, but. You know, when you have an opportunity to do a backflip in front of 11,000 people, you take the opportunity, right? <laughs> and yes. so that was that was the driving force to me. And, and so, but I, as my career developed, I realized, especially at the international level, I was sure. Well, wait, 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 Kerry, let's go back a little bit. So, okay. you know, you're saying, and that that's pretty fascinating. You say you see something once and you can do it, right? But so, right. The, especially when you're a kid, there's limited access to video. So, you know, flow doesn't exist or wherever. So... Where are right. you watching? Are you going to? I, I know you're in Pennsylvania. But are you going to University of Pittsburgh or Penn State and watching, or where are you picking it up at? Well, at a young age, a lot of stuff I was just coming up on my own. Okay. You know, like the the old single leg defense, the cut back and stuff. Yeah. I, 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 there was a time I thought I had created that move myself. I had never <laughs> seen anybody do it. Then you realize, oh, all right, this move's been around. The backflip, you know, I get credit for it, but it was a guy from, um, man, I think it was Cal State Bakersfield. He's actually reached out to me online a couple times. But I was <laughs> at the Midlands, and it was my fr my year at the Midlands in high school, and I watched this guy do a backflip, and I was stunned, and I felt like nobody in the in the arena had seen it. And then he did it a second time, and and I was like, still nobody was impressed by this move, and I was <laughs> impressed. Yeah. Um, but a lot of stuff I just kind of figured out on my own, which I said, if, if that was my, my God given talent, that's what it was. I could see stuff, but I didn't have extreme flexibility. I didn't have it leverage. I didn't have, so, you know, that's what I got, I think. And then you try to mix everything and put the tools yeah. in there. But definitely over time, like you said, my style was a little unique, but over time, uh, toward the end of my career, I feel like my style got way more, more fundamentally sound because of my my length and lack of leverage at my weight class wrestling the best guys in the world. And I realized these are, there are areas I can wrestle in. There's areas I shouldn't be in. Yes. And uh, now I drilled everything obviously, but didn't mean I wrestled there all the time. Yeah. So that makes sense. So, uh, so there, there was no club coach or high school coach that was highly influential in your uh, development through high school or multiple coaches. I, I ran into multiple guys who were influential, uh, influential in my career. There was a guy who started the freestyle club. We had a club in, in Pennsylvania, it was called. It was one of the first in in Western PA, and it was called Toss, and it, it stood for Training Out of Season Sucks. 
And uh, we used to have a club and, and a bunch of the guys would get together and, and we would wrestle there two to three days a week. Um, but there was a guy, we, we, we called him Opie. Uh, I forget his real name at this point. And he, he was into freestyle. He had traveled to Russia a couple of times and brought back some techniques. But probably like but when you talk about video, when we were at Foxcatcher, DuPont had developed a machine called Domination. And it was about 100,000 at the time. And it was a computer and had these CD-ROMs that, you know, you'd see it like an old jukebox. And it would, the, the arm would go up and grab a disc and bring it down and slide it into the player. And you would go in there and type up type in arm spin and you'd wait for about two minutes, which was fast then. And then it would bring up like six or seven arm spins that had been cut up and, and put on these CD-ROMs. And then um, that was the most amazing thing we had. And then YouTube wow. came I give it all, you know. Wow. Okay, I'm going to detour. So you want to hear about this fascinating project I'm doing right now? Yeah. You made me think of it. Uh, I'm almost, we're almost done. I got some people helping me. I've done 86 kilograms, so seven out of 10 weight classes. I have never, I've seen some people do it where they say how everyone scores at the world championships. Yeah. But I've never seen anyone do it to my satisfaction, right? I mean, there's, it's hard to put wrestling on paper. It's really, really, really hard because wrestling's not meant to go on paper. But if you're going to try to categorize and, you know, put statistics to it, you, you have to, um, that's kind of what you got to do. And so we're through seven weight classes. I'm pumped. And the fa most fascinating thing I've learned so far, and I, I think you'll probably be blown away by this too, because I was, right now, gut wrenches are scoring six to one over leg laces. Yeah. Is that is that my boy to you or no? It, 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 it's, I think it's, it's a trend, right? So, yes. so when I competed, you could only do one lace, yep. and then you had to go to another turn, right? One gut, and yes, we, we Wait. worked a lot of parterre, the transition. Yeah. And it was like, it was like you couldn't turn anybody. Now everybody locks the gut and they're just destroying people. And I imagine at some point we're going to come back and say we've taken the tech fall from 15 to 10 and we're going to come back and say, okay, you can only do a gut once and then you got to score somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I just think it's become so – everybody realizes now once you crack a guy's ribs, it, you can be so effective at ending a match that they're putting more time into it. Yeah. I, well, I, and I think, I think it's also possibly that – um, and I listen, I know this is my club, and so now I'm like, damn, I made a mistake because you know, we spent so much time on lace transitions from shots because you can end the match there. Whereas, right. like gut wrench, you got to get four of them to end the match after the takedown. Yeah. And so, we have not, I don't want to say neglected, but not put nearly as much time into gut wrenches as the laces. So, therefore, also, our guys. If our guys aren't gutting, our guys aren't getting gut defense. You know, they're not you sound like them. me when I ran club, right? So I coached yeah. the Maryland Fargo team. I, I took it over from one year, and this was back in 2008. And I spent a ton of time on on um, what was the clinch back then? The high crotch clinch, the high right? crotch or, or the body lock. Yeah, but, but we were it was the the high crotch, right? So we spent all this time and all these places to go. And then when you watched Fargo, you realized none of these high school kids ever went to the clinch. And we had wasted hours of practice time studying uh, the clinch. Well, you know, least, maybe one guy was in it. At least it'd be hard to score from a high crotch. Right. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the other thing that I think was fascinating was um, right now double leg. There's three weight classes left. We could be wrong. Double legs are outscoring single legs, which I'm fairly impressed by. Um, and I'm kind of thinking that's... Um, that's because of the new rules, right? So now if you shoot a double and you keep your hands locked, they're giving you points no matter what, even yeah. if you get dumped on your head on the other side. So maybe that's also kind of like you're saying, like a, every, your, to your point, everything is trends, right? Yeah. Once a whole group of people start doing something, uh, the early adopters have a ton of success, everyone follows them, then everyone's training against whatever that is, and then exactly. yeah. boom, the next thing goes. So yeah, change. Uh, I'll, I'm going to put that, hopefully in like the next week, I'll have graphs and, and fancy crap to put out <laughs> with it and yeah. someone will actually look at it um okay so you so you go to college um at, at penn state and you know what i what i know your career and listen i'm not i'm not young by any means um so i think a lot of other people probably feel the same way is like we have these iconic matches we see of you right but yeah. we, we don't maybe necessarily get the whole picture and so like the iconic match from your, your earlier career is you versus uh, Mark Ironside, crazy match, um, end up yeah. losing in the end of the match. Um, so I guess, for, for, and besides that, I think you were fairly dominant your first two years at Penn State, correct? You only had three or four losses or something in there? Uh, f I, I, seven losses in my career, five in the fir in my freshman year. Five in your freshman year, okay. So um, your time at Penn State, obviously, 
uh, ended. You go to, you go to Lock Haven, just right right down the road. Um, yeah. And I think that's funny because you know, obviously, you enjoyed your time there. You won two NCAA titles, and you know, there, what is it about the small college that you love so much? Because now now you're at Campbell, and I think a lot of people are saying Kerry Cole is doing a really really freaking great job at Campbell. Um, so I guess if you could go back retroactively to uh, Lock Haven, because I, you know, I also like you didn't pick the biggest college. I picked Missouri, who was a nobody at the time. Um, yeah. What was it about that environment that that let you excel so much? At, at Lock Haven, for me, my whole life was about convenience. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm a very goal oriented person, and I, I, I'm the guy that when you wake up in the morning, I need to know where I'm going, and I don't want any issues with parking my car or anything interfering with training. And Lock Haven was that environment, right? I lived above a gym. You know, I got, and it was actually the, the Alton twins that wrestled at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Their father was my landlord. He owned the gym. He gave me a key. Wait, I you knew lived, the, you knew the Alton twins when they were little? They walked in my wedding. I, I've known Come them on, five, yeah. Oh yeah. my, <laughs> that's how I got to know them. And that's so um, funny. and so I, you know, and then you know, a half mile up the road was the wrestling room. You could get in any time and drill. So it was always about convenience and I went to Lock Haven and always tell people because it was 30 miles from Penn State and I still had a relationship with John and Russ Hughes and Sinshiro Abe and so I was looking at it saying I have this relationship and I have these two platforms where I can train and so I'd work out at Lock Haven but there was a couple weekends I'd cruise over and work out, out with those guys and so I had this great partner mix happening for me. Nice. Wow, I did. I had this. so was the Alton's dad. Was he a wrestler, a coach, or something? Yeah, he wrestled at when Temple had their program. I think he was at Temple. Um, had been in wrestling his whole life, and and then um, and him and I became really close friends and and uh, stayed in touch ever since. And and um, so that's how I, I watched those kids their entire career grow up. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. It's always so funny when you don't realize there's connections. Yeah, uh, your whole life. I've been watching Alton since they were like freshmen or sophomores in high school. You know. Yeah. I never yep. realized there's any connection. Fascinating. Okay, so after college, um, what's the path? Did, did you go straight to Foxcatcher? Did you go to the OTC? Because obviously this is a little bit past my time, so I don't know exactly what well, your path well, Fox was. Well, Foxcatcher fell apart my junior year. That's when Foxcatcher fell apart. Oh, uh, because you graduated in 98? Yeah, 97. 97. 97. Right. I finished up. And then so Dave was killed in um, – 95 or 96 it was my junior year and he was killed. I think it was it was January that 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 happened so Foxcatcher dispersed and fell apart and I spent some time at Foxcatcher when I was transitioning from Penn State to Lock Haven I wasn't sure where I was going to go so my red shirt year I was kind of spending on the farm mm-hmm. um, and then the training was different right you're around you know Dave and a bunch of older guys well their you know their season didn't kick off until April pretty much you know or, or March they start to really pick up their training and I was yeah. a young guy and I wanted to go all the time, and so I spent like a semester there, and then I, the second semester I rolled into Lock Haven and, and finished out my redshirt year there. Um, and so then after that, I stayed at Lock Haven. Sinshiro Abe was my main training partner. He was uh, you know, four-time All-American, American yep. state champ, world team member, Olympic team member. And he retired, and you know, Sonny called it quits after the 1998 World Championships, and so when he quit – is when I started to bounce a little bit. I was always trying to find that 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 training partner that was stable to run with, drill with, lift with. I um, went to Lehigh for it's been a season there. Then I went to Wisconsin. I actually spent like 30 days there, and then I wound up finishing my last two uh, years at, at West Virginia. Um, it was close to home. I, the, the guys that were training there were perfect for me. And then who, uh, who was training there at the time? I'm not sure. Well, just just the guys and just, just the kids on the team. Oh, I had a really good mix of partners with the kids on the team. Because Zeke and, uh, was the head coach at that time, correct? Zeke was the assistant coach. Oh, Zeke, was yeah, assistant. Zeke was the assistant. West Virginia Turnbull was the oh, head coach. Turnbull, duh, duh. And so I, I stayed there. And then after 2000, um, you know, we had our first baby coming. And, and you know, this was the days of the, the restricted earning to, uh, coach and, and the volunteer level. And, and there was a job at Lock Haven. And I went back to my alma mater and coached and and um, took a bigger salary and, and was coaching there for a little bit and had a first child. Okay. And so I guess if, if you don't mind asking about the farm, like, you know, Dave Schultz, I, th- I think I've heard you speak and say he was a big influence on your career, like wrestling style. Uh, anyone else out there that was similar to him? Yeah, yeah, not not. But in terms of influence would be John Jira. Uh, John was a world team member back in 89, um, I think he had made the Greco world team, the freestyle. He was always a, a top three guy at 149 pounds. Um, but John wrestled with uh, Dave at Wisconsin. And then John was that calming 
forced me because I was go, go, go. And, I, you know, I, he was that guy who would be like, hey, slow down, relax. There's plenty of time. If the plane was late, I'd begin to stress because, you know, he was that guy. He was much older than me. And, and uh, still, when I have an idea, you know, you have that guy. Like if I have a, a new idea, he's the guy I call and bounce it off of him because I know he's going to pick through all the details and stuff. So John was a good training partner and a good influence. Just just he was a good coach for me and, and on the mental side of just being relaxed and enjoying things a little bit more. And, and I think that really helped me. Nice, nice. Okay. Um, so 2000, you retire. And I, and I guess, so this is another thing as I'm, I didn't know you prior to this, just something I'm seeing is, you know, there was a three or four times maybe you came back and wrestled at the open and you were kind of, yeah. felt like you were in, but maybe you weren't all the way in. Um, you know, what was it? You just weren't ready to quit or you just wanted to do it? Because like for me, I kind of want to go do it for fun. But if I go do it for fun, everyone's going to make a big deal of it, which is what they yeah. do with you. So yeah. I, I I was it that? What was it? Uh, well, I mean, for me, like I said, like, you know, I, I, I really wanted to be an Olympic champion from eight. Like, really, like, it wasn't just some kid saying yeah. it. It, like, became part of my DNA. And, you know, so in, in, I came back in, in eight. I wrestled. I did about a month of training. and came back and, and had somewhat of a decent showing at the U.S. Open. But you could tell it was a guy not training. And then in 2011, I was at UNC coaching. So... When March was over, I just started really hitting the practice room every day. And so I gave myself again another 30 days and took second at the Open in 2011. That hurt my neck and didn't go to the trials and then came back in 12 and, and had a, uh, you know, a decent match and, and lost a tight one to, to, to Bono in and, and the trials. Um, but it wasn't until the last one. And the last one was, was it 12? Man, I can't, you're right, three or four. But I lost in Iowa. Yeah. And it was the finally the time I, I, I was wrestling Chamberlain. And I, when I was putting hands on him, I remember saying, why am I doing this? You know, that <laughs> was finally not <laughs> And I lost the match. I come on, so I said, I, I don't care to do it anymore. I'm, I, yeah. It's finally out of me. You know, I'll never have that medal. It, it's done. Um, but I, I had never, you know, I wasn't training in that, that time period. If I look back and I could do it over, Ben, what I would have done was I would have taken a year or two off after 2000 when my body was still young yeah, and then came back. But I didn't think I didn't make any try, any kind of comeback until 2008. Yeah. And I, I should have tried for four. I should have, I should have made a run for four. I was, I was still young. I was still more competitive. I could have done the workouts that I used to do, but I sat too long. Yeah. Cause I obviously Bill Zadick won in, um, 2006 and that was the guy, you know, you beat him. I want to, I want to say every time, I don't know that's every time for sure. But you beat him pretty much every time, correct? Yeah, all but once, all but once, all but once. So, so I give you a lot of credit, man. I always tell people, but like he stuck with it, man. You yeah. can't. I mean, and that's like there's very few stories like that, right? Yeah. Like we like to use those guys as as, as uh, you know images for our guys and, and inspiration. And, and um, Bill, but we had a big rivalry, uh, not one that was heated vocally between each other, but we wrestled so many times from the time we were 15. Yeah. And I give Bill a lot of credit that he stuck with it till through the 2006, and, and he got it. You know, he got yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, and that's so. You know, you talk about sticking with it, and obviously, I I didn't stick with it. Um, and I, you know, I think one of the things now that I look at, and I don't like wish or want for stuff. I think that's kind of unhealthy. But like yeah. the environment with the RTCs today in 2000, say yeah. 15 or 16, whenever it really changed, um, is so much different. You know, the, like you said. I felt the same way you said, hey, I'm having a kid. I got to go make some money. I felt the same way after 08. I'm like, I know I'm going to get married fairly soon. I'm going to have some kids. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I saw MMA as my outlet, which you probably didn't even have that outlet in 2000. And I don't think that was a thing. Um, no, it's just, it's, it was like, you know, that we were still looking at the bare knuckle UFC stuff. You know what I mean? Nobody yeah. really saw it as a, as a, as a process. As a real job or anything. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So. I guess, do you ever, do you ever, think, I don't want to say, because I try not to want and wish for, but do you ever wish uh, the RTC system existed in your day so people could actually, um, I mean, because we talk about stick, you know, Bill Zanish sticking around, what we're seeing now, and I think this is one of the main reasons that USA is having so much success is these guys are actually sticking around. I mean, Jordan Burroughs is 30. I mean, think about how long Dake and Taylor didn't make a team for. It took them five and six years to make a team, and then they win a world title. So I think what we're seeing now is because of these RTCs, um, the guys can actually live uh, a comfortable life and train for the world's Olympics. So we're seeing a lot of guys stick around for a lot longer, and it's, it's really helping the depth in the American team. 
Yeah, and that, that's the key word. That's what I was going to say. It's the depth is what we have. Because when I was competing, like the number one, typically like the, the, the number three was – and four were typically really far off from the number one. You know, you might have some rivalries with the number one and number two guys, but the three and four were those guys kind of just hanging on and you knew it and they wanted to, they were getting paid, at, you know, maybe 10 grand to be somewhere and coach and wrestle with the team. And, uh, but now what you see is real depth of guys that, that you have better training situations, better partners. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's made it much easier to stay around. I don't know if I, I think I would still, I mean, maybe I'd have been better. Maybe I'd had better training partners at that level, but I, I felt like my training was fine. I, I, I felt like uh, I really knew how to train myself. I could get the best out of myself for the most parts. And I mean, hindsight's 2020, right? I, I probably should have been a little more technical and, and um, always realized that, you know, you could have some crazy protest or, or officiating and change my scores. But um, I felt like I was doing everything right at the time. And yeah, I think I, it would have helped me. Yeah. I mean, especially consider like, you know, going longer, like, would I, I always think to myself, would I have ever went to MMA had I, had I been making $60,000 a year? And yeah. I think, I think the answer is probably, I mean, I always kind of liked it and, and wanted to do the challenge, but I don't know if I would have, it would have been much tougher because obviously I loved wrestling. I still love wrestling. So, so here's the thing I would ask you then is this, and it's what I always ask people. So you, I made a choice to leave wrestling for a time period. I went into business and I was, I was in way over my head, but I always said, I have, I don't want to look at my children someday and say, yeah, your dad wrestled and all he did was coach. I needed to do something else to, to make me better and, and grow. So the truth is MMA was a real challenge, right? Yeah. You didn't know what you were going to do. Now, do you think you're better for doing MMA? Hello, damn it! Uh, got me? I got cut. Off. So, do you think? Did you say? Do you think I'm better for doing MMA? Is that what? Are you a better? Per, are you a much more well-rounded person as an individual? Um, you know, by do, but you, you went into an uncomfortable yeah. territory, right? Yeah. You only get comfortable when you when you're um, uncomfortable. You grow. You, that you way. know what I would say? I would say MMA has been fairly easy for me. I mean, it's a transition where I would say that I I love the fact that I've done this and I never would have. I never would even considered it, right? It's kind of what you said, business. Yeah. I opened up, my brother and I opened up wrestling academies in 2011 with my high school coach. Um, yeah. And it's made me grow. And then kind of being outside that wrestling, wrestling is kind of a bubble, right? Yeah. And being outside and then getting to kind of almost look back inside the bubble, that's really made me grow. And so, I, you know, I think for me, um, learning how to run a business has really allowed me to see how the world really works. Yeah, you know, and um, maybe it's not the. And if I go back, who knows? Being a college coach is something like I love for the four years I did it. I think I would have been perfectly happy, and I would have loved it if I would have done that the rest of my life. But I think um, being outside, being in the business world, having to kind of scrap for it uh, and earn it, you know. I mean, in our, in our first years, hey, if we don't get new guys to come through the door, we're going under. And yeah. that's not something. That's not a pressure that a college coach has to necessarily feel. And so I think that has what that's what made me a lot better. I think the MMA part, it's like, hey, I already need to train. I just need to learn how to punch someone, which took a while, and choke right. someone, which that was fairly easy because I tried doing that in wrestling anyways. Um, so, yeah, the, the business side, to your point, that's kind of what you said. That made me grow. It made me see the world in a new way. And I think it's allowed me now to, you know, like I get – you know who I get pissed about? And I've said this. I get pissed about Kale. I I get pissed that he won't talk. I think I think the Gable mentality was it was great is great for a certain portion of wrestlers in wrestling, right? But I think when we look, I always look at retention numbers and wrestling's hurting. We only retain sixty percent of the people every single year, and I think a lot of it is because wrestling obviously has a certain machismo to it. But yeah. every wrestling coach. Wants to bring a five or eight year old or a brand new high school kid and show them how tough it is. Like day one, yeah. it's like, what the fuck? That's just gonna scare them off. You know, it's like Carrie. If you went and dated a girl the first day, you said, "I love you so much. Let's get married next week." Right. She's well, gonna... you know what? Here, here's the change in wrestling, and, and I grew up under the Gable years. Right. He was the standard. You yeah. know, and you had to be tough, and you, you kept yourself quiet, and you, you went out there, and you wanted to be more technical and beat people up in the same process, right? Yeah. And the mindset, you know, when you have a great guy, the mindset, like people look at me sometimes and say, like, I love these college freshman and sophomore tournaments that they have. Yeah. I think that's great for development. I think it's one of the smartest things we've ever ever done. Where, uh, and then there'll be some coaches who won't put their kids in it because they say, well, 
you know, you're, you're, you're downgrading your wrestling. And I don't think that that way at all. It's like MMA, right? You don't go from, you know, Cejudo. He didn't win an Olympic gold medal and he didn't go right and fight for the UFC yeah. title, right? Yeah. right. You, you keep getting better and better opponents and, and they keep bringing them up as you come up. And I think that's where a lot of guys in terms of retention get lost because some coaches are, 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 are too stubborn to say, let me get this guy some, some matches and get, get him some be- matches under his belt and wrestle some fr- freshman, sophomore events and, and increase his wrestling over time. And, and um, but I agree with you there. And, and I think, you know, there are coaches that have to talk and promote and let people inside their head. Yeah. So, I mean, like you're, and that's what I said. One of the reasons I'm so excited about the questions with Colette is like, you're like, like, uh, I don't want to, I shouldn't pick on people. Tom and Terry, sometimes they don't feel well balanced. They feel like this robotic coaching answers and you're like genuine you got some life behind you. We kind of know your story. And it's like, Kale, it's like, obviously, there's some really great things going on in his head. He knows yeah. how to produce really high-level athletes, um, but he doesn't want to let anyone else in on the secret, which is, right. I don't know that there's a real secret to it. I think you put a whole bunch of really good guys in the room. I think, I think you have an innovative style. I think you push innovative style on them. I think they all want to be great. And you get a guy like Nolf who's making up moves left and right. And, yeah, and you get something really great, but to hear him, to, to hear him, someone a lot of high school coaches and youth coaches look up to, to hear him to you know to expound on those things time after time and time, after time instead of Terry Brands and Tom Brands just saying we we need to go harder. Um, I think that would be great. I wish we could see it. So that and that's kind of me being outside the bubble, realizing how my voice can not only help me or my club, but help a lot of people who are struggling with these issues. Um, and so that's kind of like, again, being outside the bubble a little bit to a certain extent has helped me in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, it's, it's a lot of recruiting, man. I, I mean, anybody that sits there and tells you it, it's all coaching. Coaching is, is really easy when you have the right horses in the stable. Uh, you know, I mean, you, it, I, I always use the examples like that. I'm really impressed. Like I always thought my, my future path, like before it was cool to do, I always thought I was going to do the military. And I was looking at doing the Navy SEAL thing way before any of this 9-11 stuff, right? And I had a few friends of mine who were SEALs, and this is what they said to me. And always when they said, Kerry, we don't make SEALs, right? Who who goes and gets in freezing water and does it, it you know, for, for like six months to a year? Mm-hmm. He goes, what we do is we find them. Yeah. You know, you find people who are made to do that stuff. Yeah. He says, we don't. And I, I always feel the same way to some extent about NCAA champions and world champ. You find guys with that true desire who will do everything they can. And then those guys, you just have to tweak them. You got to keep everything running. So you just got to keep tweaking them. Right. You look back at your career. You had a great coach. Right. Mm-hmm. Was he physically in there, you know, all the time saying, Ben, we're going to add this and this and this. Or was he just guiding you and tweaking you and making sure th- things in your life were being straight and, and, and he's just allowed Ben to be Ben, right? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I you know, and I think, you know, I chose Missouri. Just, I just love the feel when I went there. It was just something about it. I said, I, I know, right. I know, I'm gonna be happier. I don't know it. But you know, there was a few times when I was doing some of the things I was doing early in my career, and they were like, Ah, you're going to your back a little too much. I'm like, Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not a dumbass. I'm not gonna do that in a match. Like, right. It's, pra- it's practice. Yeah. So you know, just hey, I think I'm, I think I'm figuring something out. Just let me run with it for a little bit. And so. You know, they pushed back a little bit, right? But now, like, and that was the only experience I had at the college level. And now now I travel more. I see how college coaches are. I could see a lot of people saying, don't ever do that again. Don't, that's yeah. dumb. Don't do that. And that would have, would I have been successful? I think to a certain extent, but would I have been able to have the success um, that I had? Not nearly, because, you know, like you said, the, the God-given talent thing, yours was see, see technique and do it. And... Um, you know, mine was I lacked the the strength and speed that most people consider athleticism, but I could just go for days. I got that slow turn. Yeah. I just go and I could just go and then go. And so I have to be able to engage people continuously. For me to win, I have to be able to engage you and get you tired. Yeah. And if I can't engage you and make you work, then I'm going to struggle. And so uh, I could have, you know, obviously that was a great fit for me is that, you know, they were open to me having new ideas about the way to do stuff. And, you know, really after that first year and they realized I was in there busting my ass every single day and I was going to work hard and I wanted to be great, then it really was like, okay, Ben, just just go to work, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. So, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. It's funny you say that about them pushing back. So my big thing was 
I had that rubber knee, right? Yes. And, and I, I loved it when somebody shot in that leg because I knew you thought you were safe and you didn't realize you'd kind of just fallen into a bear trap, right? Uh -huh. And and um, but that was the first thing they did as a freshman leg carry to giving up your legs too much. And my response, I score there, you know. But uh -huh. automatically, everybody assumed, well, it's college, you're not going to score that much. And granted, I did, you know. I, I, some guys maybe hit it and stuck it, in, but it, it just made it better over time, you know. Yeah. And, and my thing, not as, as quite as innovative as yours but you know that was my area that i like to you know trick people into or make them feel comfortable yeah a absolutely so um actually i think i think you used the rubber knee in the 2000 olympic trial finals if i remember correctly M multiple yeah. times i kept thinking like why does bill zada keep falling for this move carrie keeps doing it to him over yeah. and over, and over. so I, th I think you scored many times from that um yeah, yeah so I, I think and that's where so i think there's a healthy balance kind of i don't um you know what you're saying? They let me do it, and they, and they let you do it. But it's also like now, as obviously you're a coach, I'm a coach. Um, to a certain extent, you also have to make people. And and generally speaking, when kids want to win bad enough, they they start to realize things on their own, right? Yes. But they have to start realizing, and, and sometimes you have to help them when they're doing things to their detriment. And some kids will have success to a certain level, and then they'll keep trying to do something, and they're feeling, and they're feeling, and they're feeling. And they have to say, well, hey, if this, you know, maybe if you just did this a little different. Then you'll have success there. So, you know, I, th I think as a coach, it's important to have that balance of letting them figure it out on their own and kind of giving them guidance because, you know, you, you probably, and, and myself, not only have you been successful at wrestling, you've been around a lot of other people who've had success at wrestling. Watch yeah. them, watch what they did. And so you can give those younger guys, you know, guidance uh, to maybe, I always say stubbornness is a great quality and a terrible quality. In certain yeah. ways, it's Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like me saying the F word. Hey, Matt, right. that's at uh, 3638. You got to bleep that out. Um, <laughs> in some ways, it's really fantastic. And in some ways, it's going to lead to your demise. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think stubbornness is and that that innovation is kind of a double edged sword in a certain extent. Yeah. That makes sense. Kendall Cross, you know, the Kendall, here's a Kendall Cross story I tell you. Um, Kendall Cross had a really good counter from when you front headlocked him. You'd start to run the corner, and he'd do that little outside, like Peterson tripod, and jump over your body, right? Yeah. And you know, I wrestled Kendall a couple times, and, and I learned how to defend against it. Well, Kendall thought he was really good at it, and and he was. But when you went back and you watched his video and, and broke it down, you could show him that really he was having success. Uh, probably with his eighty percent of his success was coming in the United States against guys who weren't that good, and overseas his success at that move was like fifteen percent. He was getting stunned. <laughs> Right, uh, damn, but it's yeah. when, you, when 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 the crowd goes woo and, and all these endorphins are released and your brain remembers that memory of this cool move you did. But when Bruce Burnett broke down his film and showed him internationally, the move is not it's not that it's not bad, but it's not working for you overseas. That's when he logically could make an adjustment and fix it. And Bruce did the same thing with me with my front headlock. I thought I had a really good front headlock. And, you know, first thing, first meeting I had with Bruce Burnett, and I didn't know if I liked the guy yet, was he told me my front headlock wasn't that good. And I thought, <laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, but it was the same principle. When he when internationally, I was never scoring with it. Domestically, what, I was. What, what part of your front headlock? Are you talking about anything with your front just headlock? Around, yeah, just when I had a guy in a front headlock position, I wasn't capitalizing on a spin or getting to a shot from it. Um, domestically, I was. I was beating up college guys. So I, I was coming out of a college season and made my yeah. first world team, but I was thinking, oh, yeah, I got your head down. It's over, right? Yeah. Uh, but when he reviewed my international matches, I wasn't scoring on anybody. My front headlock wasn't as tight as I thought, so I had this false sense of security. So, But mathematically, when you broke it down and showed me, it made sense, and you couldn't argue with the numbers. And that's where a good coach, like you were saying, like he was guiding just enough and showing me the areas. Of, okay, yeah. so, you got, so I put more time into it, you know, yeah. and I fixed it. Well, it's perfect in that in that, uh, in in that instance. He didn't like. He actually came with statistics, which for someone smart like you, you're gonna need some statistics. You're not just gonna say, yeah, right, whatever yeah. you say, coach. You know, yeah. Right. And then the the other one I think that I think is important. I don't know. Maybe you'll since we're going down this track, um, we only have a few minutes left. But I think it's important to say whatever you're going to say to your athletes without a bias, right? Not saying like. I told you that wouldn't work or see, you can't do that. Like, I think that's when the athletes, then they click and say like, F you coach, I'll show you. Yeah. And yeah. so like saying stuff without a bias saying like, here, I want the best results for you, obviously. But like Bruce said, you're not scoring very often. Here's the percentage. Yeah. 
I, yeah. I, I, like I do that when I teach, right? So I have a, a survey, but I'm I'm five four. So I, if I bring my guys in the center and say, okay, look, here's how we're going to handle this crackdown position. I show it, and then after I say, okay, now take in consideration, I'm five four. You're going <laughs> to have to be different. Right, your shoulder place might be there. so it's just that you're guiding them in that area and you want them to be in this area but you also as a coach and as that you got to realize uh, the way the guy does it is going to be different than the way I do it you know and you got to be smart like that absolutely all right th this was a blast you got uh any pitches you want to give us we got any, I know you guys got some competition coming up uh yeah so yeah well, so we're heading Campbell's heading to uh we're heading to Cliff Keen which you know is going to be you know uh, that that uh, pre-NCA tournament for the most part. So we're heading out there to see how our guys are going to do it. We've been wrestling really consistent, I think, as our team where we're at right now. And, and um, But this will be a, a real test to get Campbell into a, a top 10 program. And, and that's ultimately the goal here. We're consistently a top 10. We've got the resources and got the coaching staff. And it's just getting the right kids here, you know. Awesome. Okay, Kerry. This was uh, not only good for me to do for uh... – for Rudis, but this was a blast for me. I enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate you taking the time, and uh, thank you. All right, man. Have a good day, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, bro. See ya.